But out of all these shipwrecks, there's one that has been etched into the collective consciousness of the people of the Great Lakes, the Edmund Fitzgerald. And there's a reason for that. Fitzgerald is famous for two words, Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> it, it's literally a, a wreck that I think would have been forgotten if not for a Canadian songwriter who took a, a, the story and turned it into a seven and a half minute song that went to number two on the charts. American stories and our next story comes to us courtesy of Rick Mixter, a shipwreck researcher and diver who's explored over 130 shipwrecks, one of which is the subject of this story on the most famous shipwreck on the Great Lakes. Here's our own Monty Montgomery with a story. When we think of the word lake, we often think of a calm, placid, in small body of water, but the Great Lakes are anything but that. People underestimate them, you know, it literally, they think they're ponds, they think that they're, you know, they're, they're much smaller than the ocean. And the truth is that the Great Lakes span over a thousand miles, you know, Lake Superior is immense. And unfortunately, it has these jagged shoals that, uh, unlike the ocean, it, it's confined. So these shoals bounce waves back and forth, and these confused waves on the Great Lakes tend to uh, really mess with ships and, and make it very difficult to navigate in a storm. And the results of these confused seas have often been deadly. There's a huge argument on how many shipwrecks are on the Great Lakes because it's really hard to judge. This, most of the time we would put it to you know, insurance settlements. Let's look at Lloyd's of London or other places that paid out, but we don't know if they were recovered. If you said on the bottom, most people would probably throw out a number between 6,000 and 10,000 shipwrecks that are still on the bottom. But out of all these shipwrecks, there's one that has been etched into the collective consciousness of the people of the Great Lakes, the Edmund Fitzgerald. And there's a reason for that. Fitzgerald is famous for two words, Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> it, it's literally a, a wreck that I think would have been forgotten if not for a Canadian songwriter who took a, a, the story and turned it into a seven and a half minute song that went to number two on the charts. And once that happened, it became enamored not only by the people of the Great Lakes, it became their song, um, played every November. Every time you turn on the radio, somebody plays it at that time because of the gales of November and to remember the crew. Nobody argues that it, it's not Gordon Lightfoot. It is the largest shipwreck on the Great Lakes it, by a couple hundred feet. The Fitzgerald was 729 feet long and uh, lost with all hands, which was part of the mystery, I think, that captivated even Gordon Lightfoot, and uh, that's why it kind of became a story. How in 1975 could you have a 700-foot freighter with 29 men completely vanish? Fitzgerald was one of the last of the ships built in Michigan, which we used to have an amazing shipbuilding uh, prowess. We were number one on the Great Lakes for years, just a massive ship. I mean, it was the flagship for Columbia Transportation. So when it was launched, not only was she the biggest, but she was well appointed. She had the, the best skipper, according to Columbia, uh, the best cook, because they would um, entertain many of the steel companies like National Steel's president or, you know, big wigs would come on board, bring their family along. And, uh, you know, it would have inside Jail Hudson Company, the, the famous Hudson store had all of the appointments inside. So your beds, all of the furniture, which had to be custom cut to fit the canner of the uh, floor of the Fitzgerald, which was you know slightly rounded. They had to cut the legs of the bed to fit correctly. 
So it, it was the flagship. It was the ship that everybody wanted to, to be assigned to, and it was certainly the ship that gave out many rides to people. It was also fast. They called it the Toledo Express because it made that run so quickly. And for the next 17 years, the Edmund Fitzgerald would continue to make that trip from Superior, Wisconsin to Detroit, laden with iron ore. And there was no reason to expect that on November 9th, 1975, her trip under the command of Captain Ernest McSorley would go any differently. It, it was a Sunday, and it was in Superior, Wisconsin on a beautiful day, and Jack McCarthy, the first mate, would be in charge of telling the guys, you know, all the loading, make sure that the ship was loaded evenly, and which they would go underneath a gravity-fed dock, and it would actually spill these round taconite pellets into the, the cargo hold, which they took 26,000 tons. This is where Gordon Lightfoot was was wrong on a couple of accounts in his song. He said uh, fully loaded for Cleveland, but it wasn't fully loaded. It was less than uh, two thirds loaded because she was actually going to River Rouge the, near the area to the Zug Island. And in order to get into that slip, she couldn't carry all of her cargo because she would hit bottom in the Detroit River. So not fully loaded, not going to Cleveland, actually going into the Detroit area with a, a load of iron ore that would eventually become automobiles and they take off into a beautiful day. And as they do, McSorley in the pilot house actually sees that a big storm is coming up. He's got a, a radio that he can get reports through, and he's a weather ship, so he takes his observations and adds them to the weather reports to help forecasters try to develop where the storm's gonna go. And it's quickly ascertained that, that he's going to get a storm that's gonna come right through from Oklahoma all the way up to Marquette. And so he starts to calculate how long that would take and, and uses the forecast that he's getting, given as well and has to determine what he's going to do. But McSorley was a well-seasoned captain, and the coming storm likely didn't phase him too much, despite some of the reservations he may have had on the ship. McSorley had been a skipper that had been on the Great Lakes for years and years and worked his way up to the Edmund Fitzgerald. He was very stern from the people that I talked to, um, very matter-of-fact guy. As we talked uh, to a, a third mate in my documentary called The Fitzgerald Investigations, he remembered going through uh, Lake Superior Storm with just 10-foot waves where the Fitzgerald would flex so crazily, unlike any ship he had been on. And he looked at McSorley and he said, uh, man, it, it, should it be bending like this? And McSorley said, um, sometimes it scares me. So Literally, he knew that this ship was, was different than other ships. He knew that it, it would um, flex in these storms. But because as a part-time job, he did hull inspection, he was very well versed in the strength of these ships. And he unfortunately pushed the Fitzgerald way beyond its means. As I did the investigation documentary, I found the Coast Guard looked into it. They looked at 10 years at the Sioux Locks, the worst storms that ever happened up until 1975. And the one ship that kept pushing every storm and made it through the locks during those gales was the Edmund Fitzgerald. So he was a rough weather skipper. He pushed the heck out of the ship and it eventually broke because of it. 